The Egypt Game, Chapter 13. Moods and Maybes. The next day at recess, Toby Alvar slided up to Melanie and April. Before he started talking, he looked around quickly to be sure no one who mattered was looking. Ken and Toby didn't believe in talking to girls. Of course, it was all right to make comments at girls, particularly if they were insults. But real conversations were out, at least in public places. When are you guys going, you know where, again, he asked, sort of out of the corner of his mouth. I don't know, Melanie answered. We're not supposed to go there at all, yet. They're still not letting us play outside because of the murder and everything. But my folks are weakening, I think. Caroline says I can start playing outside again as soon as Melanie can, April said. Well, look, Ken and I won't go there until Friday, Toby said. Try to get your folks to spring you by then, okay? April and Melanie exchanged surprised glances. Oh, we're not just being boy scouty, Toby said. My dad got mad at me and restricted me for three days, so I couldn't go before anyway. April and Melanie tried not to giggle. Yeah, Toby said. It's all you guys' fault, too. My dad got mad at the way you guys mashed up my costume. Parents. Toby rolled up his eyes in an exasperated expression. All I ask him for is an idea for a Halloween costume. At first, he says, he's too busy to think about it. He's an artist, and he can't think up a little old costume idea. Then, all of a sudden, he gets this brainstorm, and he spends a whole day making the costume, plus a couple of hours putting me into it, and then he's so hung up on the whole thing that he gets mad when I squash it a little. April and Melanie broke down and giggled, and sure enough, Toby was encouraged. Yeah, he said. I just walked in the door, see, and my dad gives me this cold look and says, How many were killed? I start saying, what's he talking about? And he says in his icy tone, well, obviously, you've been hit by a truck. And I was just wondering about the other casualties. After that, he got louder and not so funny. And it ends up I'm restricted for three days. Tubby mugged an ex exaggerated ex expiration, look again, and strolled off, leaving the girls absolutely devastated with giggles. It was all very well having a rule about not laughing at Toby, but it wasn't always easy to stick to. That night at home, Melanie brought up the subject of playing outdoors and got her parents started on an argument about it. Her father's opinion was that we can't keep them cooped up forever, and fortunately, he won, on the condition that Marshall and Melanie promised not to play alone. So it all had to wait until the Rose Rosses could get around to talking with Mrs. Hall and Mrs. Chung and get everything all decided. And by then, it was already Thursday. On Thursday afternoon, the three girls picked up Marshall at his nursery school and hurried to Egypt. They had just one day to spend there in peace and quiet before the coming of the outsiders. It was a nice sunny afternoon and everything was right where they'd left it. But somehow, it was hard to keep their minds on the game. They were all worrying about the next day. They were wondering if the boys really wanted to play or if they just wanted to tease and make trouble. April said it wouldn't surprise her a bit if they showed up with half the boys in the sixth grade and just smashed everything to pieces. In fact, April said she thought they might just as well give the whole thing up and go away and never come back. Later, Elizabeth, with worried wrinkles in her forehead, asked Melanie if April really meant it. Were they really going to give up the Egypt game? But Melanie told her not to worry. She doesn't mean it, Melanie said. She's just in a bad mood about something, can't you tell? And April was in a bad mood. She had been in a bad mood since the day before when she'd gotten a letter from Hollywood. The letter was from Dorothea, and it was very cheery and chatter chatty. And it said that Dorothea and Nick had gotten married. Dorothea chatted about how happy she and Nick were and how she moved into Nick's apartment, and there really wasn't much room. Of course, the letter said, we're both looking forward just awfully to the time when we can get more settled and have a bigger place and have you come to live with us. But in the meantime, darling, I'm sending the rest of your things on up to Caroline's 
as the storage situation here is just terrible. There is a lot more about the big part that Dorothea was about to get, not the same one as she'd written about last time, which hadn't really been her type of thing anyways. But this new part, April hadn't finished the letter. She had torn it up into tiny pieces and flushed it down the toilet. So she couldn't change her mind and paste it back together. Then she sat on the windowsill and started off up Orchard Avenue. She had still been sitting there when Caroline came in, but April hadn't turned around. Got a letter from your mother today, too, dear, Caroline had said. She put one hand gently on April's shoulder. Hot tears had drowned April's eyes, and painful gulps climbed up her throat. She had hated the hand on her shoulder, and she had hated Caroline because it was all her fault. She'd been all right until Caroline came in just angry. Mad, 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 but all right. And then Caroline had to come in and make her cry. Caroline just stood there, and once or twice she made a little sound in her throat, as if she were going to say something, but she never did. After a while, the painful gulps wore themselves out, and the tears running down April's cheeks began to feel almost good, soothing like warm rain. Suddenly, she had felt empty and very tired, and because she was so tired, she let her head lean over towards Caroline, just a little bit, not really touching, but almost. They stayed that way for quite a while, and then Caroline had given April's shoulder a squeeze, kissed her quickly on top of the head, and gone out. April had sat there a while longer, tasting the tears on her face with the tip of her tongue, and thinking how long it had been since she'd cried enough to taste. And thinking, too, that a kiss on top of the head was okay and didn't make you want to rub it off the way a kiss on the cheek did. Things were better after that, but April had gone on being in a bad mood. Melanie didn't know about the letter, but she knew something was wrong, and she was worried. Friday afternoon was going to be difficult enough without April being in one of her touchy moods. But by Friday, April was in a much better frame of mind. Melanie could tell that she had gotten her mind off whatever it had been that was bothering her because she started making cheerful plans in school about getting the best of Ken and Toby. That afternoon, the girls and Marshall got to the storage yard first, and they were all sitting on the edge of the temple floor just waiting when Ken and Toby arrived. Ken had to do a certain amount of squeezing and inhaling to get through the fence, but skinny Toby came through almost as easily as the girls, now that he wasn't wearing boxes. They didn't say much at first, just hi. And then the boys started looking around at the altars and the things on them. The girls watched warily, trying to figure out just what they had in mind. After a few minutes, Melanie decided that Ken really didn't have anything in mind at all. He looked reluctant and puzzled and a little bit embarrassed. She decided that Ken was only there because Toby was... So she started watching Toby. It was easy to tell by looking at Toby's dark eyes that something important was going on behind them. They almost gave you the feeling that you could hear things inside his head going, Wurching, buzz. But for once, it didn't seem to have anything to do with laughter. Melanie began to get the feeling that maybe Toby wasn't just there to tease and cut up after all. So when Toby started asking questions about the things on the altar, and about Set and Isis, Melanie started giving straight answers. At first, April poked her and frowned in a way that said not to give everything away. But after a while, she changed her mind and started answering questions too. She even took the secret scrolls out of their hiding place in the hollow base of the statue of Diana and showed the boys a list of things to do for different ceremonies. And the party partly finished hieroglyphic alphabet. Finally, Toby left the shed and walked to the middle of the yard. Ken looked relieved. Well, I guess that's all there is to see, he said to Toby. We might as well split, huh? We still have time to get in the game up at school. But Toby shook his head. I don't feel like playing basketball, he said. Besides, I sort of go for this Egypt stuff. Let's hang around for a while, okay? Ken shrugged. Sheesh, he said. I don't care, 
but the whole scene's pretty kooky, if you ask me. It turned out that Toby wasn't kidding. He really did go for the Egypt game. He wanted to hear and see everything, and that first afternoon, he somehow managed to talk the girl Egyptians into doing all their ceremonies and rituals over for him to watch. At first, they were still a little suspicious and embarrassed, but when it became clear that he wasn't going to tease, they became more enthusiastic. A couple of times, he even made approving comments like, Hey, weird, or holy cow. Ken was pretty respectful about the whole thing, too. He kept hitting himself on the forehead and saying, Sheesh! But his tone of voice seemed to indicate amazement more than anything else. As they were leaving a little before 5.30, Toby asked the girls to write down the names of some of the best books about Egypt. He said he was going to the library that evening to check some out. That night, April and Melanie sat on Melanie's bed, and, feeling very pleased with things in general, they discussed the future. The first meeting of the enlarged Egypt gang had gone off much more smoothly than they had expected. They didn't admit it, even to each other, but they had both been flattered by Ken and Toby's respectful interest. And maybe, after a week or two, they'll lose interest, Melanie said. <laughs> Melanie said, maybe they'll play for a while and then they'll get homesick for their old ball games and everything will be just like it used to be. Yeah, April agreed. I'll bet they do, or else maybe they won't even come back at all. Maybe they were just curious, and now that they know all about it, they just might not bother to come back. And I don't think that they're going to think to the other kids either, at least not as long as they don't get mad at us or something. You know, I wouldn't be surprised if they just don't show up tomorrow at all.